Hello, I'm Professor Paul Bingham, and this is Biochemistry One. The purpose of this segment is to take the first major step toward mastery of enzyme kinetics. And let me put that into, into a sort of context for you. So remember that our, our overall goal has been, and will continue to be for a little while, understanding how the protein machines that genes encode uh, turn into the three-dimensional molecular machines that uh, uh, do all of the different things that uh, uh, biological organisms need them to do. They are the basis of almost all of biochemistry. And in this segment of uh, uh, the course, we're focused specifically on that subset of molecular machines that are molecular catalysts, uh, usually called enzymes. And remember we talked in, in, in earlier segments about the fundamental physical chemistry and thermodynamics of catalysis. Remember that uh, A plus B going to P plus Q, as diagrammed on the screen here, has a certain free energy establishing the equilibrium outcome. But it also has another parameter that's very important, the activation energy, which determines how quickly you go from the higher free energy A plus B state to the lower free energy P plus Q state. And remember that the rate of that reaction is exponentially related to the magnitude of that activation energy. And so, in fact, you can catalyze reactions dramatically by coming in and reducing that activation energy. We've talked about all of this in earlier segments. Let's, let me remind you, as we've al also already talked about, how exactly enzymes do this. They, this is the uh, non-catalyzed version of the reaction, spontaneous version, you might say. And this is a diagram of the enzyme-catalyzed version in which the enzyme substrate complex is the key functional entity. It is the entity that's going to manipulate the substrate in various ways, depending upon the enzyme, to reduce the activation energy and dramatically accelerate the rate of the reaction, the enzyme substrate complex, as it's called. And remember what the enzyme substrate complex does, as we've already talked about. That is, there's the inherent free energy, uh, I'm sorry, the inherent free energy of activation, the inherent activation energy of the reaction in the uncatalyzed form, symbolized here as delta G sub N, delta G double dagger sub N. And then the much lower free energy of the catalyzed reaction, that lower free energy again being lowered by the physical influence of the enzyme on the substrate, influencing the forward progress of the reaction. So what we've established this as the sort of inherent dynamic picture of the reaction going left to right on the screen here. And then in the last segment, we looked in detail at an enzyme that's extraordinarily well characterized, the pancreatic RNA enzyme. It's a very small enzyme, very stable, very easy to work with. And because we eat lots of cow meat, there's a tremendous amount of pancreatic cow enzymes available to work with. This enzyme has been studied by uh, for tens of thousands of man years, probably, we understand in exquisite detail, including the X-ray crystallographic structure of a substrate bound to the enzyme, as shown in this image, and as we talked about in detail in an earlier segment. The problem is that we rarely have the time and resources to lavish on every enzyme we'd like to know about, that we've lavished on a few, like pancreatic ribonuclease here, or a few others that we'll see in later segments. Nonetheless, we'd like to know as much as we can about those enzymes, even though we can't lavish this much attention on them. That's the first issue. The second issue is that experimentalists, biochemists, began to study enzymes well before it was even clearly established that they were, in fact, proteins. In other words, they were confronted with a very subtle problem. They had some kind of activity that they could purify to some degree or another out of some extract or another that was catalyzing a reaction. They needed to understand how to study it well before they had all of the insights and, and very sophisticated contemporary tools that you and I have. So for both of those reasons, because we can't always lavish this much attention on each enzyme, and because we originally started studying enzymes before we had any of these tools to lavish this much attention, even if we wish to, a class of approaches referred to as enzyme kinetics emerged in the early 20th century, and they continue to be very useful tools in spite of all the newer tools that we have. And so in this section, we're going to look at the basics of enzyme kinetics and of enzyme kinetic analysis. And as you'll see as we move forward a little bit today and more in subsequent segments, being able to kinetically analyze enzymes in this way is a way to garner a surprisingly sophisticated insights into how they work. So let's look first to, at some of the details of the dynamics of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. So this is the enzyme substrate. This is the basic reaction again. So now re remember what the entities are that you start with the substrate being transformed into a product S and P in the diagram here. And you form an enzyme substrate complex in between. Here is this slightly complicated diagram, but notice what it says. It says that over time, an enzyme catalyzed reaction, substrate is going to decline 
uh, for the obvious reason that it's being transformed into product. Okay, very simple. Now the question is, what do the kinetics of enzyme substrate complex look like? That's diagrammed here in the red box at the bottom. Notice what you see. What you see is at the early stages of the reaction, rapid uh, formation of enzyme substrate complex. This diagram is actually slightly misleading here to make it easy to look at. That event is actually extraordinarily rapid, as we'll see in a moment. But notice what happens after that period of, of rapid formation of enzyme substrate complex levels. They stay roughly constant over a long period of reaction until the substrate begins to be extensively consumed and the product begins to extensively accumulate. During that extended period, the rate of change of enzyme substrate complex is approximately zero, as diagrammed by the simple little first order differential equation there. There's essentially no change. So steady state is generally achieved uh, very rapidly, typically on the order of milliseconds. So it's essentially instantaneous from our point of view. And then that steady state level of enzyme complex remains virtually unchanged, depending upon substrate and, and product uh, initial concentrations, uh, for minutes or even hours, depending upon the enzyme and what kinds of uh, situations that we can set up. So why have we taken the time to talk through this logic here? Because in order to mathematically represent what's going on in an enzymatically catalyzed reaction, we have to make some simplifying assumptions. Otherwise, the mathematics becomes prohibitively difficult to work with. So our first simplifying assumption is enzyme substrate complex is present at a steady state concentration. And as this slide emphasizes, that is an excellent approximation of conditions in the reaction, particularly as we'll see early in the reaction. So you almost instantly form a steady state concentration of enzyme substrate complex, which then remains virtually unchanged for quite some time, long enough for you to work with uh, analytically. All right, so that then, that first simplification of the problem gets us to the point where we can begin to look at one of the key early formal simplifications of the mathematics of describing enzyme catalysis, the so-called uh, Michaelis-Menten equation. This is the equation I'm going to show you in a moment, and one that it's fairly simple. You should commit it to memory because you're going to be using it over and over again in all kinds of uh, contexts, and in particular, obviously, solving exam uh, questions. But also, as you'll see, understanding the Michaelis-Menten equation will give you a much deeper understanding of how enzyme catalysis actually works. So this is, again, our little diagram that we saw a moment ago, uh, where substrate is declining, uh, product is accumulating, and for a long period of time, uh, uh, enzyme substrate complex is at a constant steady state concentration. Now the next question is, how do we do measurements under conditions that allow us to simplify this uh, situation even further? In fact, we do something uh, very specific. We do what's called an initial velocity measurement. It's often called V sub zero, meaning uh, velocity of the reaction effectively at time zero, or as close as we can measure it. So notice here the, four sol the three solid lines are actual pr uh, progress of the reaction, that is production of uh, uh, a consumption of substrate or production of product over time. And now notice the um, dotted lines, each is essentially a tangent to time zero on those reaction curves. They are, in fact, initial velocity. They are the initial velocity of the reaction under conditions uh, where you've, you've um, set up a, a reaction typically with substrate, no product yet. You put a small amount of enzyme in or whatever amount is required, and immediately, as fast as you can, you start measuring the production of product. Okay? So initial velocity is, uh, uh, reflects the steady state concentration of the enzyme because from a human point of view, initial velocity measurements are made on the time scale of seconds maybe even a minute or two, whereas steady state concentration, remember, of the enzyme substrate complex is typically achieved in a time scale of milliseconds. Right? All right. So let's think now for a minute about the implications of this assay zone. See the little purple uh, rectangle there? That's describing to you the circumstances under which initial velocity measurements are actually made. And remember that the, the time to uh, establishment of steady state enzyme substrate complex is, in fact, artificially exaggerated in this diagram to let you see it. It's actually essentially instantaneous on a, on a human time scale. So what happens when we do this? So let's look again at our equation. If, we're w if we want to look at the dynamics of enzyme substrate complex and we want to describe it mathematically in particular, it's a little complicated.